silver bells, silver bells, it's transmismus time in the city, ring-a-ling, hear them ring, soon it will be transmismus day. Merry Transmismus, gentle listener, and welcome to our nocturnal transmissions Transmismus special retrospective extravaganza. Thank you for lending us your ears in 2021. We do hope our regular little diversions have provided some respite from the difficulties this year has continued to inflict upon us. To lift your spirits in this, the season of giving, we've decided to give you a gigantic, groaning, bumper, transmismus stocking full of transmissiony goodness. Throw away your Perry Como albums, ditch the Buble, chuck the Dean Martin, and eject the Elvis. We're giving you a long play barrage of oral yuletide atmosphere. Every Transmismus episode released to date in one big ribbon-topped package. You'll be positively sick of the season by the time we're finished with you. You lucky dog. However, before we commence our relentless fusillade of festive frights, let's meet our final fledgling Patreon acolytes for 2021. A big welcome to Amanda Asbill, Helena Handbasket, Big Evil 50, Ryan Kelly, and... Daryl Boyce. Thank you for choosing to support our pernicious production. We have lots of exclusive stories waiting for you in our Patreon subscriber exclusive feed. More than enough, we hope, to tide you over until we recommence our transmissions next year. Thank you to all our beloved Patreon subscribers. We're well aware that we don't always manage to express our feelings in a coherent or appropriate manner, but we hope that you can hear in the exclusive content we craft for you, beloved patrons, the appreciation and affection we feel towards you. If we've managed to chill, repulse, disgust, or dismay you with any of these stories, then I feel we've made our feelings No. Anyway, enough of this pandering. Let's get the big, ugly, pine-scented ball rolling, shall we? Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present the Nocturnal Transmissions Transmissimus Special Retrospective Extravaganza. Starting with the story of the goblins who stole a sexton by Charles Dickens. Enjoy. In an old abbey town down in this part of the country, a long, long while ago, so long that the story must be a true one, because our great-grandfathers implicitly believed it, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard, one Gabriel Grubb. 
It by no means follows that because a man is a sexton, and constantly surrounded by the emblems of mortality, therefore he should be a morose and melancholy man. Your undertakers are the merriest fellows in the world, and I once had the honour of being on intimate terms with a mute, who, in private life and off duty, was as comical and jocose a little fellow as ever chirped out a devil-may-care song without a hitch in his memory, or drained off a good stiff glass without stopping for breath. But, notwithstanding these precedents to the contrary, Gabriel Grubb was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow, a morose and lonely man who consorted with nobody but himself, and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large, deep waistcoat pocket, and who eyed each merry face as it passed him by with such a deep scowl of malice and ill-humour as it was difficult to meet without feeling something the worse for. A little before twilight, one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself towards the old churchyard, for he had got a grave to finish by next morning, and feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. As he went his way up the ancient street, he saw the cheerful light of the blazing fires gleam through the old casements and heard the loud laugh and the cheerful shouts of those who were assembled around them. He marked the bustling preparations for next day's cheer, and smelled the numerous savoury odours consequent thereupon as they steamed up from the kitchen windows in clouds. All this was gall and wormwood to the heart of Gabriel Grubb and when groups of children bounded out of the houses, tripped across the road and were met, before they could knock at the opposite door, by half a dozen curly-headed little rascals who crowded round them as they flocked upstairs to spend the evening in their Christmas games, Gabriel smiled grimly and clutched the handle of his spade with a firmer grasp as he thought of measles, scarlet fever, thrush, whooping cough, and a good many other sources of consolation besides. In this happy frame of mind, Gabriel strode along, returning a short sullen growl to the good-humoured greetings of such of his neighbours as now and then passed him, until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard. Now Gabriel had been looking forward to reaching the dark lane, because it was generally speaking a nice, gloomy, mournful place into which the townspeople did not much care to go, except in broad daylight and when the sun was shining. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a merry Christmas in this very sanctuary which had been called Coffin Lane ever since the days of the old abbey in the time of the shaven-headed monks. As Gabriel walked on and the voice drew nearer, he found it proceeded from a small boy, who was hurrying along to join one of the little parties in the old street, and who, partly to keep himself company, and partly to prepare himself for the occasion, was shouting out the song at the highest pitch of his lungs. So Gabriel waited until the boy came up, and then dodged him into a corner and wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times, just to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand to his head, singing quite a different sort of tune, Gabriel Grubb chuckled very heartily to himself and entered the churchyard, locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, set down his lantern, and getting into the unfinished grave, worked at it for an hour or so, with right good will, but the earth was hardened with the frost, and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out and although there was a moon, it was a very young one, and shed little light upon the grave which was in the shadow of the church. At any other time these obstacles would have made Gabriel Grubb very moody and miserable, but he was so well pleased with having stopped the small boy's singing, that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made, and looked down into the grave when he had finished work for the night, with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one, a few feet of cold earth when life is done, a stone at the head, a stone at the feet, a rich juicy meal for the worms to eat, rank grass overhead and damp clay around, brave lodgings for one, these in holy ground. Ho, ho, 
laughed Gabriel Grubb, as he sat himself down on a flat tombstone which was a favourite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas, a Christmas box. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, 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 repeated a voice which sounded close behind him. Gabriel paused in some alarm in the act of raising the wicker bottle to his lips, and looked around. The bottom of the oldest grave about him was not more still and quiet than the churchyard in the pale moonlight. The cold hoar frost glistened on the tombstones, and sparkled like rows of gems among the stone carvings of the old church. The snow lay hard and crisp upon the ground, and spread over the thickly strewn mounds of earth, so white and smooth a cover that it seemed as if corpses lay there hidden only by their winding sheets. Not the faintest rustle broke the profound tranquillity of the solemn scene. Sound itself appeared to be frozen up. All was so cold and still. It was the echoes said Gabriel Grubb, raising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with astonishment and terror, for his eyes rested on a form that made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone close to him was a strange, unearthly figure, whom Gabriel felt at once was no being of this world. His long, fantastic legs, which might have reached the ground, were cocked up and crossed after a quaint, fantastic fashion. His sinewy arms were bare, and his hands rested on his knees. On his short, round body he wore a close covering ornamented with small slashes. A short cloak dangled at his back. The collar was cut into curious peaks, which served the goblin in lieu of ruff or neckerchief and his shoes curled up at his toes into long points. On his head he wore a broad-brimmed sugar-loaf hat, garnished with a single feather. The hat was covered with the white frost, and the goblin looked as if he had sat on the same tombstone very comfortably for two or three hundred years. He was sitting perfectly still. His tongue was put out as if in derision, and he was grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. It was not the echoes, said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb was paralyzed and could make no reply. What do you do here on Christmas Eve, said the goblin sternly. I came to dig a grave. Sir, stammered Gabriel Grubb. What man wanders among graves and churchyards on such a night as this? cried the goblin. Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. Gabriel looked fearfully round. Nothing was to be seen. What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Hollands, sir replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he had bought it of the smugglers, and he thought that perhaps his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Hollands alone, and in a churchyard, and on such a night as this? said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! exclaimed the wild voices again. The goblin leered maliciously at the terrified sexton and then, raising his voice, exclaimed, And who then is our fair and lawful prize? To this inquiry the invisible chorus replied in a strain that sounded like the voices of many choristers singing to the mighty swell of the old church organ, a strain that seemed borne to the sexton's ears upon a wild wind and to die away as it passed onwards. But the burden of the reply was still the same, Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! The goblin grinned a broader grin than before, as he said, Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? 
said the goblin, kicking up his feet in the air on either side of the tombstone, and looking at the turned-up points with as much complacency as if he had been contemplating the most fashionable pair of Wellingtons in all Bond Street. It's, it's very curious, sir, replied the sexton, half dead with fright. Very curious and very pretty, but I, I think I'll go back and finish my work, sir, if you please. Work, said the goblin. What work? The, 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 the grave, sir, making the grave, stammered the sexton. Oh, the grave, eh, said the goblin. Who makes graves at a time when all other men are merry, and takes pleasure in it? Again the mysterious voices replied, Gabriel Grubb! Gabriel Grubb! I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin, thrusting his tongue farther into his cheek than ever, and a most astonishing tongue it was. I'm afraid... "'My friends want you, Gabriel,' said the goblin. "'Under favour, sir,' replied the horror-stricken sexton. I, "'I don't think they can, sir. Sir, they don't know me. Uh, sir, I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me, sir.' "'Oh, yes, they have,' replied the goblin. "'We know the man who struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart, "'because the boy could be merry, and he could not. "'We know him! We know him!' <laughs> "'Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh, "'which the echoes returned twentyfold, "'and throwing his legs up in the air, stood upon his head, "'or rather, upon the very point of his sugar-loaf hat, on the narrow edge of the tombstone, whence he threw a somerset with extraordinary agility right to the sexton's feet, at which he planted himself in the attitude in which tailors generally sit upon the shop-board. I, I am afraid I must leave you, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us, said the goblin, "'Gabriel Grubb going to leave us! Ho, ho, ho!' As the goblin laughed, the sexton observed, for one instant, a brilliant illumination within the windows of the church, as if the whole building were lighted up. It disappeared, the organ pealed forth a lively air, and whole troops of goblins, the very counterpart of the first one, poured into the churchyard and began playing at leapfrog with the tombstones, never stopping for an instant to take breath, but overing the highest among them, one after the other, with the most marvellous dexterity. The first goblin was a most astonishing leaper, and none of the others could come near him. Even in the extremity of his terror, the sexton could not help observing that while his friends were content to leap over the common-sized gravestones, the first one took the family vaults, iron railings and all, with as much ease as if they had been so many street posts. At last the game reached to a most exciting pitch. The organ played quicker and quicker, and the goblins leaped faster and faster, coiling themselves up, rolling head over heels upon the ground, and bounding over the tombstones like footballs. The sexton's brain whirled round with the rapidity of the motion he beheld, and his legs reeled beneath him as the spirits flew before his eyes. When the goblin king, suddenly darting towards him, laid his hand upon his collar and sank with him through the earth. When Gabriel Grubb had had time to fetch his breath, which the rapidity of the descent had for the moment taken away, he found himself in what appeared to be a large cavern, surrounded on all sides by crowds of goblins, ugly and grim. In the centre of the room, on an elevated seat, was stationed his friend of the churchyard, and close behind him stood Gabriel Grubb himself, without power of motion. "'Cold tonight,' said the King of the Goblins. "'Very cold. A glass of something warm here.' At his command, half a dozen officious goblins, with a perpetual smile upon their faces, 
whom Gabriel Grubb imagined to be courtiers on that account, hastily disappeared and presently returned with a goblet of liquid fire, which they presented to the king. Ah! cried the goblin, whose cheeks and throat were transparent as he tossed down the flame. The swarm's one indeed. Bring a bumper of the same for Mr. Grubb. It was in vain for the unfortunate sexton to protest that he was not in the habit of taking anything warm at night. One of the goblins held him, while another poured the blazing liquid down his throat. The whole assembly screeched with laughter as he coughed and choked and wiped away the tears which gushed plentifully from his eyes after swallowing the burning draught. And now said the king, fantastically poking the taper corner of his sugar-loaf hat into the sexton's eye, and therefore occasioning him the most exquisite pain. And now show the man of misery and gloom a few of the pictures from our own great storehouse. As the goblin said this, a thick cloud which obscured the remoter end of the cavern rolled gradually away and disclosed, apparently at a great distance, a small and scantily furnished, but neat and clean, apartment. A crowd of little children were gathered round a bright fire, clinging to their mother's gown and gambling around her chair. The mother occasionally rose and drew aside the window curtain, as if to look for some expected object. A frugal meal was ready spread upon the table, and an elbow chair was placed near the fire. A knock was heard at the door, the mother opened it, and the children crowded round her and clapped their hands for joy as their father entered. He was wet and weary and shook the snow from his garments as the children crowded round him and seizing his cloak, hat, stick and gloves with busy zeal ran with them from the room. Then, as he sat down to his meal before the fire, the children climbed about his knee and the mother sat by his side and all seemed happiness and comfort. But a change came upon the view, almost imperceptibly. The scene was altered to a small bedroom where the fairest and youngest child lay dying. The roses had fled from his cheek and the light from his eye, and even as the sexton looked upon him with an interest he had never felt or known before, he died. His young brothers and sisters crowded round his little bed and seized his tiny hand, so cold and heavy. But they shrank back from its touch and looked with awe on his infant face. For calm and tranquil as it was, and sleeping in rest and peace as the beautiful child seemed to be, they saw that he was dead, and they knew that he was an angel looking down upon and blessing them from a bright and happy heaven. Again the light cloud passed across the picture, and again the subject changed. The father and mother were old and helpless now, and the number of those about them was diminished more than half. But content and cheerfulness sat on every face, and beamed in every eye, as they crowded round the fireside and told and listened to old stories of earlier and bygone days. Slowly and peacefully the father sank into the grave, and soon after the sharer of all his cares and troubles followed him to a place of rest. The few who yet survived them kneeled by their tomb and watered the green turf which covered it with their tears, then rose and turned away, sadly and mournfully, but not with bitter cries or despairing lamentations, for they knew that they should one day meet again, and once more they mixed with the busy world, and their content and cheerfulness were restored. The cloud settled upon the picture and concealed it from the sexton's view. What do you think of that? said the goblin, turning his large face towards Gabriel Grubb. Gabriel murmured out something about its being very pretty and looked somewhat ashamed as the goblin bent his fiery eyes upon him. You're a miserable man, said the goblin in a tone of excessive contempt. You! He appeared disposed to add more, but indignation choked his utterance. 
so he lifted up one of his very pliable legs, and, flourishing it above his head a little to ensure his aim, administered a good sound kick to Gabriel Grubb. Immediately after which, all the goblins in waiting crowded round the wretched sexton, and kicked him without mercy, according to the established and invariable custom of courtiers upon earth, who kick whom royalty kicks, and hug whom royalty hugs. "'Show him some more,' said the king of the goblins. At these words the cloud was dispelled, and a rich and beautiful landscape was disclosed to view. There is just such another to this day within half a mile of the old abbey town. The sun shone from out the clear blue sky, the water sparkled beneath his rays, and the trees looked greener and the flowers more gay beneath its cheering influence. The water rippled on with a pleasant sound, the trees rustled in the light wind that murmured among their leaves, the birds sang upon the boughs, and the lark carolled on high her welcome to the morning. Yes, it was morning. The bright, balmy morning of summer. The minutest leaf, the smallest blade of grass, was instinct with a life. The ant crept forth to her daily toil, the butterfly fluttered and basked in the warm rays of the sun. Myriads of insects spread their transparent wings, and reveled in their brief but happy existence. Man walked forth, elated with the scene, and all was brightness and splendor. You, a miserable man! said the king of the goblins, in a more contemptuous tone than before. And again the king of the goblins gave his leg a flourish, again it descended on the shoulders of the sexton, and again the attendant goblins imitated the example of their chief. Many a time the cloud went and came, and many a lesson it taught to Gabriel Grubb who, although his shoulders smarted with pain from the frequent applications of the goblin's feet thereunto, looked on with an interest that nothing could diminish. He saw that men who worked hard and earned their scanty bread with lives of labor were cheerful and happy, and that to the most ignorant the sweet face of nature was a never-failing source of cheerfulness and joy. He saw those who had been delicately nurtured and tenderly brought up, cheerful under privations, and superior to suffering, that would have crushed many of a rougher grain, because they bore within their own bosoms the materials of happiness, contentment, and peace. He saw that women, the tenderest and most fragile of all God's creatures, were the oftenest superior to sorrow, adversity, and distress, and he saw that it was because they bore in their own hearts an inexhaustible wellspring of affection and devotion. Above all, he saw that men, like himself, who snarled at the mirth and cheerfulness of others, were the foulest weeds on the fair surface of the earth and setting all the good of the world against the evil, he came to the conclusion that it was a very decent and respectable sort of world after all. No sooner had he formed it than the cloud which had closed upon the last picture seemed to settle on his senses and lull him to repose. One by one the goblins faded from his sight, and as the last one disappeared, he sank to sleep. The day had broken when Gabriel Grubb awoke, and found himself lying at full length on the flat gravestone in the churchyard, with the wicker bottle lying empty by his side, and his coat, spade, and lantern, all well whitened by the last night's frost, scattered on the ground. The stone on which he had first seen the goblin seated stood bolt upright before him, and the grave at which he had worked the night before was not far off. At first, he began to doubt the reality of his adventures, but the acute pain in his shoulders when he attempted to rise assured him that the kicking of the goblins was certainly not ideal. He was staggered again by observing no traces of footsteps in the snow on which the goblins had played at leapfrog with the gravestones, but he speedily accounted for this circumstance when he remembered that, being spirits, they would leave no visible impression behind them. 
So Gabriel Grubb got on his feet as well as he could for the pain in his back, and brushing the frost off his coat, put it on and turned his face towards the town. But he was an altered man, and he could not bear the thought of returning to a place where his repentance would be scoffed at and his reformation disbelieved. He hesitated for a few moments, and then turned away to wander where he might and seek his bread elsewhere. The lantern, the spade, and the wicker bottle were found that day in the churchyard. There were a great many speculations about the sexton's fate at first, but it was speedily determined that he had been carried away by the goblins, and there were not wanting some very credible witnesses who had distinctly seen him whisked through the air on the back of a chestnut horse blind of one eye, with the hind quarters of a lion and the tail of a bear. At length all this was devoutly believed, and the new sexton used to exhibit to the curious, for a trifling emolument, a good-sized piece of the church weathercock which had been accidentally kicked off by the aforesaid horse in his aerial flight, and picked up by himself in the churchyard a year or two afterwards. Unfortunately, these stories were somewhat disturbed by the unlooked-for reappearance of Gabriel Grubb himself some ten years afterwards, a ragged, contented, rheumatic old man. He told his story to the clergyman and also to the mayor, and in course of time it began to be received as a matter of history, in which form it has continued down to this very day. The believers in the weathercock tale, having misplaced their confidence once, were not easily prevailed upon to part with it again, so they looked as wise as they could, shrugged their shoulders, touched their foreheads, and murmured something about Gabriel Grubb having drunk all the Hollands, and then fallen asleep on the flat tombstone. And they affected to explain what he supposed he had witnessed in the goblin's cavern by saying that he had seen the world and grown wiser. But this opinion, which was by no means a popular one at any time, gradually died off. And be the matter how it may, as Gabriel Grubb was afflicted by rheumatism to the end of his days, this story has at least one moral, if it teach no better one. And that is, that if a man turns sulky and drink by himself at Christmas time, he may make up his mind to be not a bit the better for it, let the spirits be never so good, or let them be even as many degrees beyond proof as those which Gabriel Grubb saw in the goblin's cavern. Merry Transmissmas, everybody. Ah, we've done it. Another year under the belt, as they say. And yet again, quite a year it has been. We've travelled from dark, menacing catacombs to far-flung alien planets. We've met ghosts and ghouls, gangsters and gods, even the gargantuan black goat of the woods. And it's Thousand Young. Oh, such fun. However, all good things must come to an end, gentle listener, and 2018 is no exception. Thank you for your continuing support. If you've just discovered us, well, welcome aboard. You've got a lot of catching up to do. Luckily for you, we'll be taking a brief hiatus over the Transmissimus New Year period, in which you may don your headphones and binge on the blackness which nocturnal transmissions, like some infernal wet nurse, has thus far produced for your enjoyment. Happy suckling, my dear. And to our long-term listeners, I would encourage you to go back through our catalogue and re-listen to your favourite tales while we're resting on our laurels. At the risk of shamelessly blowing our chosen author's trumpets, 
we have endeavored to select stories which are worthy of revisiting. I guarantee a second listen to some or all of these tales will not disappoint. Which brings us to our final tale of 2018. We've chosen a delicious morsel of yuletide unpleasantness for you this time, gentle listener. Pour yourself an eggnog, put your feet up on a loved one, and enjoy Felix Blackwell's There's Always Time for Christmas. I don't know the guy who was Santa Claus before me, or the guy who came after. All I know is that on December 24th, 2015, it was my turn. I was at an airport bar at the time, stranded between flights due to a sudden blizzard. Everybody around me looked as miserable as I felt. None of us were going to make it to our families on time for Christmas. I sat there with a flat root beer, texting with my girlfriend Faye and batting away the occasional offer of something stronger from the bartender. Dinner wasn't that good anyway, Faye said. You didn't miss much. I'll make it up to you guys, I replied. Faye and I had just visited my mother in Boston. But my mom came down with the flu during our trip. I stayed behind an extra few days to take care of her. Faye flew out to a parent's house in Colorado, and I expected to meet her there before Christmas dinner. Fucking weather, somebody grumbled behind me. Goddamn snowstorm's getting heavier. You kidding me? I glanced over and saw a chubby guy in a Celtics jersey staring incredulously at the bar TV. A clatter of glass landing on the counter in front of me made me jump. Found some private reserve in the back, a man said. When I looked down, I saw a bottle of a beta root beer frothing and fizzing all over itself. Some of the foam ran down over a set of withered fingers. My eyes followed them to a gnarled hand, then up a twiggish arm and into the face of a young man. On the house he continued. Other guys on break. I won't say anything if you don't. Uh, thanks, dude, I said, taking the bottle and knocking back a few slugs. I tried to hide my disgust for the man's hand. He stared at me, smiling, unblinking, until I set the bottle back onto the table. Merry Christmas, he said, and turned away. Merp. I tried to speak, but the words died at my lips. The bar went vertical and my head slammed into the counter. I could hear myself snoring even before the darkness took me. I woke up to my feet sliding across smooth linoleum. Chatter in some guttural language emanated all around me, washing into my mind on waves of dizziness. Those claw-like hands gripped my arms and neck. Lights passed over my head, illuminating the warped faces of three strange men. I was being dragged somewhere. I heard doors crash open and slam shut. I felt the sting of winter wind on my face. I saw the glitter of runway lights. I smelled something that invoked memories of my grandpa's horse stables, and then my body collided with a wooden seat. The hands tore off my clothes and wrapped me in something warm and velvety. Someone slapped my face. Jagged fingernails sliced their way down my cheek. Wake up, asshole! A familiar voice called out. You fucking... you put in my... the drink, I mumbled. Nobody goes willingly, the man replied. He leaned over me and tightened a seatbelt around my waist. As his face neared mine, I saw a pointed ear jutting from his hair. 
Dead skin curled up from its edges, and a dirty earring dangled from it. Who the fuck are you people? I spat. I could feel my senses returning. My vision blurred once more, and the impact of another hand seared my face. All you gotta do is take the bag to the chimney, someone said over my shoulder. Spirit is the rest. What? I said. What spirit? I tried to look behind me, but a fist pummeled the back of my head. The spirit of Christmas, you fucking chucklehead. I demanded an explanation for all this. The men whispered to each other in that impossible, horrific language. All around me, colorful beacons glowed and blinked in strange lines. As far as I could tell, we were on the runway. The man who'd spiked my drink sat down next to me. His voice softened. Behind me, his buddies prepped whatever vehicle we sat in. Look, the man said, this isn't fun. It never is, not even for us. You've been chosen to do a job, and you're gonna do it. Then you get to go home. No time lost, no one will know you're gone. There's no way you can fuck this up if you just do as you're told. I looked down at the clothes that shoved on me. It was a stained and ragged Santa costume. Are you out of your fucking mind? I shouted, struggling against my seatbelt. The man was on me like lightning, clutching my throat with those sandpaper hands and digging those putrid fingernails into my windpipe. He pulled me toward him and held my face over the side of the vehicle. Now, we floated a hundred feet above the runway. A passenger jet circled in the gray overhead. You are Santa, he growled. This is your sleigh, and those, he stabbed a finger into the air before him, those are exactly what the fuck you think they are. Dangling mid-air in front of the sleigh were a dozen darkened forms, prominently crowned with racks of antlers. A string of Christmas lights popped on across their ranks, revealing their wretched details. The figures were people, naked and brutalized and strung together in razor wire. Their broken limbs dangled uselessly like the legs of a wasp in flight, and their bodies were bent into prone submission. The antlers appeared to be shining white bones, recently torn from a hundred arms and legs and fingers and set into the skulls of their wearers with rusty nails. The words, What the fuck is that? tried to escape my mouth, but only spotted gasps made it through. Those are the ones who refused. The man whispered into my ear. One of the reindeer looked back at me for just a moment. Icicles encrusted its mournful eyes, and a deathly pallor blued and grayed his features. He tried to speak, but his lips had been so shut. But I'm, I'm not Santa! I stammered against the howling wind. My whole body shook. Santa's not really a person, the man replied, draping an arm around my shoulder. He's more of a title. That's the magic of Christmas, buddy. You only have to do this shit once. But why me? Because you understand. He said, your childhood was filled with wonderful Christmases. You've got a good family, and now it's your responsibility to keep the magic alive for a new generation of kids. I'll check in with you. Don't let me down. And by the way, don't worry about the list. The bag handles all that now. 
the man retrieved a barbed whip from the floor of the sleigh and cast it out over the reindeer. It sliced up the line of creatures and cracked against the lead one, sending ribbons of blood spraying into the frozen air. Muffled groans of agony wafted from their sealed mouths, and then the man simply leaped off the sleigh and vanished into the night. His friends followed suit. The sleigh took off, cutting winding paths through the darkness and soaring above the storm. I clung in terror to the handrail beside me, praying that I was on some kind of heroic dose acid trip and that I'd wake up soon. We sailed over little towns and across bodies of water. Eventually, my gruesome chariot descended upon a neighborhood, and we thumped down onto a quaint little house replete with ornaments and lights. For a long moment, I just sat, too scared and cold to move. One of the reindeer men looked back at me and snarled, beckoning me to do my job or else. I reached into the back of the sleigh and retrieved a heavy sack. The thing felt scratchy and oozed with foul liquids I dared not ponder. The entire thing looked like a patchwork of human scabs and gore. Just take the bag to the chimney, the man's voice echoed in my head. I scanned the roof and found no chimney, only a little exhaust pipe that probably vented a stove or bathroom. I reluctantly approached. The reindeer watched me in silence as I looked over the thing, trying to figure out what to do. My first idea was to empty the contents of the sack one by one into the pipe. As I reached into the bag, an unspeakable pain ignited in my toes. I collapsed onto the roof, holding my feet and trying not to scream. The fiery sensation shot up my feet, then my shins, then my thighs. The sickening crackle of bones snapping rang out in the night, followed shortly by my terrified wails. My shaking, malformed legs bent into unholy angles and stretched themselves out toward the pipe. They went in, and the rest of my body with them, as I writhed in agony against the otherworldly force that possessed me. I slid down the pipe in a jumble of shattered bones, then shot out onto the floor of a dark room. My body re-inflated. The bones set painfully and fused, and my organs redistributed themselves to their proper homes. I lay there for what felt like ten minutes, gathering myself and forcing air into my blistering lungs. The disgusting sack of presents lay just beside me. I was inside someone's house, a stranger's house. He could have a gun. He could shoot me dead where I lay. I could be arrested. If anyone catches me, I'll be stuck in a ward with the psychos till the end of my days. A million thoughts invaded my mind. But they were soon replaced by the image of the reindeer. I had a job to do, and by God, I was going to do it. I picked up the sack and stumbled through the house until I saw the glow of a Christmas tree. I approached it, dumped the contents of the sack all over the ground, and headed for the front door. As I did, that fiery pain reignited in my feet, and soon I found myself face down on the carpet, sliding backwards towards the room I'd landed in. 
I screamed, and voices arose in the bedroom upstairs. A large man rushed down the staircase, but I was back in the pipe and up on the roof before he saw me. I clambered into the sleigh, tears and snot drenching my face, and shouted for the ugly creatures to fly. They didn't budge. I urged them with a gesture, but they refused to move. They only stared into me. Some of them didn't even have eyes. Black divots yawned from their skulls and dripped blood down their pasty cheeks. I reluctantly grabbed the whip, but before I used it, a Christmas carol played in my head. On Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer and Vixen, on Comet and Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. I croaked the words into the night and felt the sleigh lurch. Soon we were in the air again, and moments later we were on another roof. It took several minutes to find the courage to even move. I lay there in the sleigh, fantasizing that this was all a nightmare and that I'd wake up soon. But when the reindeer started to become restless and agitated, I retrieved the sack and found it inexplicably full again. I stepped out onto the roof and, to my relief, saw a chimney stack. The ride down wasn't as painful. Only a few bones broke this time, mostly in my skull and jaw. My arrival had interrupted a couple having sex beside their tree. I ignored their petrified gazes and dropped the presents where I stood. Merry Christmas, motherfuckers, I grumbled. Then I folded over backwards, groaning at the crunch of my spine, and slithered back up the chimney. The woman's horrified screams followed me. And so this continued for hours. I covered block after block, surrendering to the misery of pain and cold that haunted every minute of the journey. I had no gloves, and my shoes were woefully unfit to keep me warm so high up in the air. Snow caked every inch of my clothes and turned to water each time I entered a house. I never stopped trembling. Atop one roof, just before I snuck down another chimney, the man from the bar appeared. How's business? he asked. He grinned, flashing me a row of jagged teeth. Fuck you, I replied, tossing the bag into the chimney. It slid down with a slurping noise. Need anything? You got a gun? The man laughed and approached me. Now, don't go trying anything stupid, he said, brushing some of the snow from my coat. You jump off that roof, you'll just get sucked right back up here, same way as the chimney. You try to run away, we'll find you. You think you're the first guy to plot an escape? The man wrapped an arm around me and directed my gaze to the reindeer. Hey, Dasher, he called out. Tell this schmuck how you got your name. One of the reindeer lowered his head in fear. His antlers clattered against the razor wire that imprisoned him. And what happens if I grab one of those kitchen knives down there and slit my own throat? I asked, challenging the man. Your Christmas spirit got a plan for that too? The twisted joy on the man's face vanished. No, he replied. In fact, it dies. Not just for you, but for everyone. He looked out over the town. An ocean of Christmas lights glimmered as far as I could see. All those kids. 
I shoved the man away and trudged over to the chimney. What do I eat? I called out. I'm fucking starving. I've been doing this for hours. The man smiled again. Hope you like cookies and milk, buddy. I'm lactose intolerant, I shot back. Well, he said, looking around at the roof. You can eat snow. Fucking prick, I mumbled and dove into the chimney. On and on I marched, across rooftops and down chimneys and vents and pipes. I even slid through the cracks beneath old windows and doors. Once I seeped in through a leak in the attic. I dropped presents and wolfed down cookies. I drank milk and faucet water and sometimes raided fridges. I shat in strangers' toilets and told little kids who spotted me to go fuck themselves. All I wanted to do was get back to my girlfriend, my family, my life. But it never ended. After thousands of houses, I lost count. I lost track of time. The world blurred into an endless night of repetitive tasks. I slept between cities and over oceans. I warmed myself by the fires people had left burning and scorched myself on them as I left. Unspeakable burns and blisters and cuts and bruises crisscrossed my wretched form. But the suit always remained the same. Weathered, but functional. Tens of thousands of homes passed. Countless little towns. Infinite arrays of apartment buildings. I mostly navigated those by sliding around in the septic tanks and crawling out of toilets. I ate and slept and delivered presents. I snarled at anyone who saw me. I aged. My body expanded beneath the weight of all those cookies. My face plumped. My cheeks reddened. My hair grayed and dyed to winter white. Madness festered in the depths of my mind. At first, only whispering nonsense to keep me entertained. But then, the voices darkened and commanded me to live out their fantasies. An ineffable, psychotic boredom compelled me to play pranks. I switched the name tags on presents. I unwrapped some of them so the kids couldn't. I loomed over people in the dark and watched them as they slept. I shook with jealous rage as they enjoyed their holiday. I wanted to hear them scream as I did every time my bones collapsed inside me. So I hurt them. I bludgeoned them with presents. I carried the whip inside with me and sometimes flayed the families I didn't like. The families without proper chimneys. I choked some of them to death. I wanted to see their faces turn as blue as the faces of my reindeer. I hid their bodies beneath their Christmas trees and stuck little festive bows in their hair. But the night still wouldn't end. It went on and on for years. Decades! And the sun never rose. Morning light 
never conquered the horizon. The howls of the wind never died. The snow never stopped falling. I lost track of everything. I lost my count, my path, my memories, my name. Lost it all to the dark. The only thing I could remember anymore was the solitary phrase I uttered. On Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. And then, on one occasion, as I slid down a chimney, I stumbled upon a little girl sleeping on a couch beside the tree. I hurled the presents on the floor, not caring if I woke her, and turned to leave. As I did, a tiny voice chirped out. Santa? I whirled around, ready to growl a string of curses at her, but saw that she held out a green piece of paper with both hands. I made this for you. I know you work really hard. I cautiously approached and took the paper from her hands. It had a drawing of me and nine happy little stick-figure reindeer, one with a glowing red nose. Gold and silver glitter caked the entire thing, and a scrawled message at the bottom read, Thank you, Santa. Love, Kelly. We were making Christmas cards at school, the girl went on. I know lots of kids send you letters telling you what they want, but maybe nobody just makes you a thank you card. You're all alone on Christmas. The card went blurry as tears welled in my eyes. I tried not to let them fall. After a few seconds, I managed to find my voice. Thank you, sweetheart, I said. That was very nice of you. I'll keep this forever. The little girl threw her arms around my huge gut and hugged me. I ushered her back to the couch and tucked her in. Merry Christmas, I whispered. I made sure Kelly's eyes were closed before I returned up the chimney. I made sure not to scream as my collarbone snapped and my ribcage caved in. The moment I reformed on the roof, a gnarled fist collided with my face. I saw the clouds. I felt the roof's shingles on my back. And then I heard that familiar voice say, Well done, kid. I awoke, face down on the bar counter in the airport. People bustled all around me. The glass bottle of root beer sat beside me. My body was young and thin again, and warmth coursed through my veins. The man with the ugly hands approached me from behind the bar. Don't miss your flight, he said, tapping his wrist with a clawed finger. What? How did... I tried to speak. The heavy haze of sleep weighed down on me. Everything's fine, he interrupted. Get going. It's like I told you before. He flashed that fanged smile at me. There's always time for Christmas. La 
Merry Transmissmas, gentle listener. As we bid a, well, not so fond farewell to the year that was, and cast our eyes to the horizon where we see the faintest intimation of the soon to be enjoyed warm glow of a fast approaching brand new year ripe with promise. It's time to reflect on our adventures during this, our most recent trip around the great golden ball. We managed to survive encounters with monsters of the deep, monsters from the stars, and monsters of the mind. We met ghosts, oh, so many ghosts this year, gentle listener. A man-eating tiger, a very frightening rabbit, some very creepy pumpkins, even a space potato, for goodness sake. Ah, happy, happy memories. Thank you, gentle listeners, for lending us your ears. And to all our wonderful minions, acolytes, and cohorts who chose to support us through Patreon in 2019, I can't possibly thank you enough. Nevertheless, I'll try. Thank you. Have a happy and safe festive season, everyone. We'll see you in 2020. Until then, as always, what... Oh, oh, I nearly forgot. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present our final offering for 2019. Brandon Faircloths. Someone decorated my house for Christmas. Someone decorated my house for Christmas. Part One Last month I moved into my new house. Not that the house was new, mind you, but it was new to me. My husband died two years ago. And after struggling, both emotionally and financially for months, I had gotten a good job at a local software company only an hour's drive from my hometown. For a time, things started to look up money-wise, but it was still hard to go home every day to a house filled with memories of my time with Mark. I had started saving up to get a new house next year, but this past September my boss gave me the news that I was being promoted. And transferred. The new job was two states away, and while the company was paying for moving expenses and temporary housing until I found a house I wanted, I was still caught between being nervous about moving to a place I didn't know and worried about losing my job if I couldn't quickly find a house I could afford. So imagine my relief when, on my first house scouting trip, I found the perfect place. It was on the outskirts of town in an older, spread-out neighborhood with big yards and wide, quiet streets. The house itself had been built in the 1940s, and while it had apparently sat empty for several years, it was in surprisingly good repair. It was also way bigger than anything I could have afforded back home, with a large front porch and a second story that contained two more bedrooms and a large master bath. I was moved in by the middle of November, and by the time I went home for Thanksgiving last week, I was mostly unpacked, aside from a few of Mark's belongings that I was keeping in storage until it hurt a little less to see them. Holidays have been especially hard since he died, but between the new job and house and being happy to be around my family again, I've been pretty occupied and had a really good time during my visit back home. But while I loved my new house, 
I'd be lying if a part of me didn't dread driving back to it and the relatively lonely new life it represented. Maybe that's why my first reaction to the plastic snowman in my yard was surprise and delight instead of confusion or concern. It was a very old-fashioned looking three-foot snowman wearing a red scarf and green mittens. And as my headlights swept across it as I pulled into my driveway, it almost looked like it was giving me a little wave. This was late Sunday night, and I was a bit punchy from hours of driving. But I remember letting out a small laugh as I stopped the car and looked at it. It was close to the street, but too far in and well positioned to have fallen out of a truck or been placed in my yard unintentionally. I pulled on up in my driveway and got out slowly, looking around as though I was going to see the responsible party waiting behind a bush at close to midnight. For all I knew, it could have been there for days. I just had no idea where it had come from. I'd met all my neighbors, at least I thought I had, and they all seemed like nice, normal people. But most of them were significantly older than I was, and I hadn't become really friendly with anyone in the past couple of weeks certainly not give me a random decoration friendly and I didn't think anyone at my new office even knew where I was living since I'd moved out of the company's extended stay rooms maybe Carol in HR might but she was hardly ever around in the first place and I didn't see her trekking out here to stick a weird snowman in my yard because that was the other thing the snowman was a little weird it didn't look weathered or dirty, but it did look old, like an authentic prop from a Christmas movie set in the 50s. If someone was going to give me a Christmas decoration, why would they pick something like this? And why would you just randomly stick it in the yard rather than on the porch with a note or something? I didn't have any answers to any of this, and was too tired to care beyond a certain degree of curiosity. So I patted the snowman on its head and went inside to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, there were two reindeer closer into the house. The snowman was still there, but now he was turned facing the house and seemed a few feet closer as well, and nearer still were the two plastic reindeer that had the same old but well-preserved look as the snowman. They were also turned toward the house, as though part of some mass Christmas exodus across the lawn toward my front door. I was running late for work, so I only had time to snap a picture with my phone and jump in my car. I sent the picture to my sister and asked her what she thought. As I expected, her response was basically that it was fucking awesome and I should keep her updated if they kept adding more cool shit to the yard. The fact that they were trespassing and that it was rarely a good sign when mystery people started weirdly fixating on you seemed to escape her. Still, maybe she had a point. Maybe it was a practical joker neighbor with a twisted sense of humor trying to welcome me to the street. Or maybe I had a work acquaintance with too much time on their hands. Maybe Carol was never at work because she was roaming the streets in a panel van filled with antique decorations, scouting out yards for her next gorilla art exhibition. Or maybe a dangerous nut job had taken an interest in me. This last thought worried me, but it seemed unlikely at first, and when I woke up on Tuesday with no change in the decorations, I was actually a bit disappointed. I even texted my sister and told her that I thought the phantom decorator might be done. I had to go to the grocery store that night, so it was well after dark before I got home. When I did, I saw a third reindeer, and a small pair of what I supposed were meant to be carolers were sitting at the bottom of my steps. At first I felt a little happy thrill of excitement and I grinned as I noticed that the other two reindeer and the snowman had made their way closer in as well, but my smile faltered when I saw the front of the carolers. Just like the older decorations, they were of well-kept but ancient-looking plastic, 
and based on their height and the shape of their plastic hair, I assumed they were meant to be a small boy and girl. But it was hard to be sure because their faces were gone. I don't mean they were like some decorations where the face has no features by design. This was like someone had taken a hot iron to them. In the place of a nose and eyes and singing mouth were tangled mounds of rough, melted plastic. That's when I called the police. As you might expect, that amounted to very little. I couldn't really blame them. It looked like a vaguely creepy prank of some kind, and they said there hadn't been any similar pranks reported this year. They promised to touch base with my closest neighbours just to see if anyone heard or saw anything, and one of the officers assured me that just having them ask around would likely spook whoever was doing it enough that it might very well stop. The next morning, when I sleep stumbled into the kitchen to make coffee, I froze. Sitting on my kitchen table was a gingerbread house. It looked as though it had been sprayed with some kind of sealant at some point in the past, and while it didn't look nearly as old as the yard decorations, the translucent film coating every surface of it was run through with cracks and yellowed like an old man's toenails. And underneath the film, exploiting all the wounds and the protective seal were the house's inhabitants. Tiny roaches, worms, other small specks of hungry movement that roamed across the sugary snow-topped roof and bit little holes through the candy window panes. I could faintly smell a dry, rotting odor coming from the gingerbread house, but it was a combination of that endless movement and the sour pang of fear in my belly that made me try wretch into the sink several times before I was able to call 911 again. That was on Wednesday. The police seemed more concerned, but could still do very little. They said the neighbors hadn't seen anything, but that they would follow back up with them about this latest invasion. So I had the locks all changed during an extended lunch break, and that night after work I spent money I didn't have to buy a couple of little security cameras. You know, the Wi-Fi type you can put pretty much anywhere, and that have okay night vision. This morning, I woke up with my bedroom filled with tiny Christmas figurines all made of discoloured cracked porcelain and ranging from cardinals wearing festive hats to dancing elves with hands full of toys. They were everywhere, from my nightstand to the dresser and on both window sills. I eased out of bed slowly, thinking to check underneath before putting my feet down. There was nothing there, but as I stepped back from the bed, something else caught my eye. A small porcelain angel was laying on my pillow next to where my head lay, and, like the carolers outside, its face had been burned away. I'm too shaky to drive at the moment, so my sister is coming to pick me up and carry me back to my parents' house for the next couple of days. Maybe the police will find something, someone, and make it stop. At least I think I have their attention now. Because, aside from the figurines, I also thought and pulled up the cloud-recorded camera video from last night on my phone. For the most part, there was nothing. But at 3.38 a.m., one of the cameras caught seven seconds of movement. It was the faint silhouettes of three shapes moving up the stairs toward my bedroom. And one of those roaming shadows seemed to be dressed like Santa Claus. Part Two I wake up to the sound of my sister drowning. I'm tied to a chair, 
and it's one of my kitchen chairs that I've always been so proud of because it was the first set of furniture me and Mark bought as a married couple. Hard wood and well made. So well made that it doesn't even creak as I thrash against it. The cords of the Christmas lights binding me to the chair, cutting into my arms and breasts as I push and pull against them. I have the crazed thought that I'm all lit up because someone has bothered to plug in the lights. But I push it aside as I hear a new, terrified gurgle as they begin drowning my sister again. I call out for them to leave her alone, to leave us both alone. But I know in my heart there's no point to my words. So instead I begin trying to shimmy and turn my chair enough that I can see what they're doing to her. As though bearing horrified and helpless witness will make it better that they're killing Melanie. There are two figures holding her down. One is an average looking man in his late fifties. Well, average looking except for the frenzied sweat pouring down his face and his insane expression full of wide eyes and skinned back teeth. It was hard to say if he was angry or excited, but as he grasped Melanie's ankles tight enough to make his hands go white, I realized it made little difference. He was gripped by the same fervor that was driving the two monsters in the room. The first of the others might have been a woman once. It was hard to say because of how twisted her flesh was and how distorted her features had become. I had the thought that she was a candle made of wax and human fat and carved to look like a person. A candle that was held to some terrible flame long ago until the eyes drooped and ran and the nose pooled away into a flattened bulge with two uneven holes for air. And the mouth... The mouth was filled with rotten little pegs of yellowed ivory as it hung open at the bottom of her head like an open, festering wound. She held Melanie's shoulders and alternated between looking at her and at me with deep-set black pig eyes, all the time working a greyish-green striped candy cane at the corner of her lips that looked like strips of red, wet meat. The woman thing let out a titter as Melanie tried to struggle again. My sister was strong, but she was clearly already tired, and the creature easily pressed her shoulders flat again as the next jug was made ready. Presiding over it all, dressed in tattered rags that likely had once been a very expensive Santa suit, was the third thing. It looked more like an old sinister tree than a candle or a man. The odd angles of its body and joints making the soiled red coat shift and poke like a sack holding a large, struggling spider. It held the jugs of what smelled like eggnog over Melanie's face and poured them slowly in the general direction of her mouth and nose, each new gallon causing my sister to sputter and choke again. For all the lack of care in getting it in her mouth, the Santa creature seemed very deliberate and intent on its work. Its face was still primarily human showing the worn features of an old, thin man with a patchy grey beard and sad, roving eyes that sometimes seemed to flicker with a dim, green light. The man's lips were thin and ceaselessly moved as he poured, his eyes locked on Melanie's as he slowly killed her. He kept saying the same word over and over, his deep, dry voice seeming to constantly be on the verge of breaking with emotion. Believe. 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 Three hours earlier, I was sitting at the police station waiting for my sister to come pick me up when I got a text from her. At the house... Where are you? Question mark. I felt my heart start thudding in my chest. I had specifically told her that I would wait at the police station for her because I didn't want to go back to the house. What made her go there? Fumbling with my phone, I tried to quickly call her, but I was interrupted by another text. I think I saw you inside. I'm coming in. 
I punched the button to call her, but it just rang and rang before going to voicemail. I tried a second time as I started heading up to the front desk at the station to ask for help. That's when I saw she was calling me back. Hello? Mel, you need to get out of... You need to come home, Clarissa. It was an older man's voice, but it was unfamiliar. You need to come home so we can get started. If we have to start without you or you ask your police friends to come, well, it won't go well for her. And we'll still catch up with you later. Please, let her go. I'll come back. That's fine. Just let her go first. I thought I heard a brief, sour laugh from the man. We just need the two of you to help us with something. And then we'll be on our way. Promise. I went to the house without telling anyone. A dozen times I almost went back to the police or called 911. But each time I saw the image of my sister, torn apart except for her beautiful face. Her dead eyes staring at me, accusing me, saying that she was only dead because she tried to help me. Because of something that, if not my fault exactly, was at least my responsibility. I went back to the house and stifled a gasp as it came into view. The yard was now full of plastic snowmen and reindeer, candles and carolers who had stood too close to a flame. Most of them were pointed toward the house like an angry mob, but a handful were turned to where I parked in the driveway behind Melanie's car. It was as though they were there to usher me in, and as I stepped out of my car I saw a path had been cleared all the way to the front door. I glanced around for Melanie outside, but it was a dim hope. I knew where she'd be. Stepping up onto the porch, I pushed at the door, feeling no surprise when it swung in quietly. I could already smell the gagging aromas that filled my house. Cinnamon and pine needles mixed with spoiled meat and soured milk. Holding a hand to my nose, I stepped in and called out for my sister. When I heard nothing, I called out to them. I'm here, okay? Now, please, let her go. Use me for whatever it is you need and then please leave us both alone. I swallowed, trying not to think about what would come next. Whatever unknown torture or shame was waiting for me in the shadows. The main thing was to try and get Melanie out. I just had to focus on that. That thought, that goal, steeled me for a few seconds as I went deeper into the house. I saw with unsurprised dread that there was a large lopsided Christmas tree in the living room now, its discoloured branches decorated by a combination of lights, old-fashioned ornaments and various small dead things and bits of bone. Even from a distance I thought I saw pieces of at least three small animal skeletons strung together and draped around like macabre tinsel. Just then, I saw movement at the corner of my eye and turned. They were coming out to greet me. I don't know how to describe this next part in a way that will make any sense, but I will do my best. One of them, the man that appeared to be human, was stepping out of a door made into one wall that I never knew existed. It swung closed behind him with a silent solidity that left no seam in the wallpaper or other sign a secret door existed at all. But the other two, they flowed down the walls somehow, their shapes pushing beneath the wallpaper and making it stretch before going back with no sign of what had just passed beneath it. The moving bulges slowly worked their way to where the wallpaper met the baseboard, and there they pulled themselves out into the room like 
decaying toothpaste being squeezed from a tube. I have trouble remembering this. I think because my mind couldn't really understand what it was seeing. But in a matter of moments, they were standing before me, even as the other man was approaching me slowly. Easy now, it's better if you don't fight. Just give up and it will be easier. Promise. His mouth twisted into a cruel smile at the last part. And the next moment I was dashing back through the house with the goal of either finding Melanie or making it out the back door to get help. I never should have come here. I never... And then I woke up to my sister, drowning. I think she'd been dead for the last two jugs worth of their rancid eggnog concoction. My screaming and tears during the last few minutes having pushed me into a kind of exhausted stupor. I felt burned out, used up, and for the moment I didn't care what they did. I deserved it for letting Melanie die. But when the man touched my chin gently, I jerked back in surprise, and looking up at his somber expression, I felt a new wave of anger and hatred filling me. You motherfucker! I'll fucking kill you for what you did! I looked behind him to where the two monsters were gently wiping Melanie off like they were apologetically cleaning up a spill. Don't you fucking touch her, you fucking freaks! The man tapped my chin lightly, and when I looked up, his gaze was hard. Don't be rude to my parents. They meant your sister no harm. We're only doing what we have to, and you're the one who brought her into this. I gritted my teeth. That's a lie. I told her not to come here. He nodded, a small smile passing over his face. That's true, but while I'm not special like they are yet, they have still passed along a few tricks and talents. <gasps> the last few words sounded like my voice, and my widening eyes brought his smile back. None of us wanted to trick her or hurt her. We don't want to hurt you either. But we need you to believe shook my head slowly. You're insane. Believe? Believe in what? God? That small, sour laugh again. I saw that his monstrous parents had finished cleaning Melanie, neglecting to get up the gallons of strange eggnog congealing on the floor. No, no, nothing like that. Just believe in the holiday of Christmas. We're not after religious or spiritual belief. Just the trappings. He leaned closer as he continued in a conspiratorial whisper. You know, reindeer, sleigh bells, mistletoe. We've been trying to give you Christmas spirit for days, but you haven't been very receptive. He raised his hands as he continued in a lower voice. I know, I know, their methods can be off-putting. They put out the gingerbread house without my knowing it. He gave a chuckle. <laughs> I mean, I've been staying in the house a lot since you moved in, but I still have a job and other responsibilities. Sighing, he looked back at them over his shoulder as they began to move closer. <sighs> to be honest, I think they're going insane. But you need to understand, it's not their fault. They're going insane? What about you? I was tired of this. If he was going to kill me, just do it and get it over with. The man tapped my chin again, a bit harder this time. Touché. Tell her. The man thing's voice was booming, but at the same time it was somehow hollow, like a storm's wind pushing between dead winter trees. Explain why she must believe. 
A look of irritation passed over the son's face. Getting to that! He stood up and took a couple of steps back. When I was a teenager, my parents got a mysterious invitation to a hotel out west called the Imago. They had never heard of it, but when they asked around, they found out it was some big deal fancy place that only the super rich and powerful ever visited. We're talking ten stars out of five star hotels. But the hotel apparently picked lottery winners once a year. How they selected them, or even knew my parents existed, we never found out. But my father was an accountant, and my mother worked the front office for a pediatrician. They'd never have another chance like this, so they jumped at it. The man sat down on one of the other kitchen chairs, seemingly oblivious to the liquid soaking into his pants. His expression had grown darker, but also more sane as he looked off at the far wall. When they came back a week later, they were different. At first it was in positive ways. They both seemed younger and stronger, smarter even. He puffed out a breath. Oh, and they could do things, things that seemed like magic. When I would ask them about it, they would laugh it off, but I knew they were lying. In time, things started to swing back the other way. They were sick a lot, and they seemed to be aging, changing almost overnight. By the time I was 25, they couldn't leave the property. They'd become bound to it somehow. By the time I was 30, well, it wasn't good for anybody to see them anymore. And they had taken to disappearing into the bones of this place by then, anyway. We've spent so many years trying to fix what happened to them. And despite their problems, I've spent all that time trying to become like they once were. Because what they were, it was wonderful. Their mistake was leaving the Amago. They're sick because they came back here for me. This was all insane. Just kill me. I don't believe any of this. Bunch of crazy bullshit. He leaned forward and slapped me across the face before I could pull back. When he spoke, his voice was hard and dangerous. Just listen. They want you to understand so you don't think they're being mean, that they're bad people. They want you to hear it, so you're going to fucking listen. Clearing his throat, he continued. <clears throat> they figured out that whatever magic they got from that place, if they can get a bit of it back, they'll be able to leave this house and go back to the hotel, to the special room they had there, and all they think they need is someone to believe. He stood up, his face drawn as he began to pace. I tried to do it for them, but it doesn't work. We've had a couple of prior owners, but it didn't go well. Maybe because terrifying someone with old creepy decorations isn't the way to give someone Christmas spirit? He chuckled and nodded. <laughs> you know, you might be right. But like I said, they aren't thinking as clearly as they used to. Brain rot and all. Turning back, he looked at me with a glint in his eye. Sometimes I think I might be slipping a little myself. But we've made do with what we had on hand, and had to hope for the best. The woman thing stepped forward and pulled something from ragged remains of a pocket on the father's Santa coat. Her voice was thick and hard to understand as she tried to talk around her mouldering candy cane. Please help us. Help us be free and get back. Despite everything, I felt myself feeling sorry for her. I didn't know what to say or what to believe. 
I knew I wasn't going to be of any help to them, even if it was true. The only thing I knew for sure was I was about to die when they saw all this was pointless. And I felt some grim satisfaction in knowing they wouldn't get what they wanted after what they had done. However pitiful they might appear. But then the front door was banging open, and I heard men shouting. I was turned away from the commotion, but within a matter of moments the sun was heading towards me, and then being yanked backwards by the inertia of multiple bullets striking him at once. I think he was dead before he hit the floor, and I saw his ruined parents glance at him sadly before fading back into the walls of that place. I caught a flutter of movement as the woman dropped what she had been holding in her twisted fingers. Two policemen were talking to me now, the same ones that had taken my earlier reports. I could tell they were both shaken, and though they were calling an EMT, I knew it was too late for Melanie, or the son of the things that killed her. After I was freed, I managed to swipe the paper the mother had dropped though I didn't get to look at it right away. First, I had to give a heavily modified version of what had happened, leaving out the monster parents that were still living in the walls of that fucking house. The police didn't press hard, and judging by the haunted looks, those two men had caught a glimpse of the truth before it had faded back into hiding. Either way, I was released to my parents, released to tell them that their other daughter was dead. I considered telling them the whole truth, but what was the point? They would just worry that their surviving daughter was insane. When we were on the way back home, back to my real home, I finally dug out the piece of paper and looked at it. It was a faded invitation that was surprisingly clean and well-preserved. I thought of that woman creature holding it out toward me as some kind of pleading explanation. It was probably their most prized possession. It came from the place they needed to get back to, after all. It said, the Imago Hotel cordially invites you on an all-expenses-paid trip to enjoy our hospitality. You have been selected for this very unique and life-changing experience, which includes access to all our amenities and a seven-day, six-night stay in one of the most celebrated of our renowned holiday rooms. The room chosen for you is the Christmas Room. You will be contacted again shortly to confirm your arrival time. I studied the card in the dim light of the passing countryside, tears stinging my eyes. I had no idea what any of this was, and I didn't want to know. All I knew was that I had lost enough and wanted no part of whatever this card had or might still represent. So I rolled down the window and let the rushing air take it away. I hope it is never found, but if it is, let it be far away from me. night before Transmismus, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that Saint Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. 
when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but the merciful end of a terrible year. Goodbye and good riddance, 2020. Nevertheless, Merry Transmismus, gentle listener. It's time to sign off on another year of transmissions. Thank you for listening to us in the year that was. We will be returning in 2021, and do so hope that you will again choose to lend us your ears, such that we might once again pour our leprous distillment of horrific prose into those porches. We have a number of exciting things in development that we just can't wait to share with you in the new year. Not least of all, the triumphant return of a voice from darkness with the inimitable Dr. Malcolm Ryder. Stay tuned, and we'll keep you posted as developments arise. And now, it's time for our final presentation for 2020. Nocturnal Transmissions is proud to present... Krampus by Jeff. Speezy Alley. Each year on December 5th, people in my hometown are brutally murdered. The police are at a loss. Everyone in my town lives in fear and some refuse to leave their homes. With each victim, a poetic story is left behind. These are those stories from the last three years. Frederick loved to smile, for he was always glad, happy, warm, and gentle, never, ever sad. But Frederick had a secret, one he only knew. This man loved to strangle children. He turned them cold and blue. The townsfolk never found them, for he was very smart. Frederick took their corpses and pulled them all apart. It couldn't be young Frederick, everyone would say. He is a man of God. We always see him pray. The cold night came, and Frederick rested his head. But soon he heard a scratching underneath his bed. Frederick trembled as he looked, oil lamp in hand, on his bedroom floor. The demon had a plan. Away with you, beast! The night is dark and long. You have no business here, for I have done no wrong. Krampus only laughed as he shook his rusty chain. He hung Frederick by the neck until he writhed in pain. The lynx constricted, digging into skin. Frederick then cried out, paying for his sin. 
he begged and pleaded until his final breath. With a beautiful snap, Frederick met his death. Krampus hung him out to dry, and all the townsfolk began to cry, but not the children, for now their souls were free, and under Frederick's body, the phantoms danced with glee. Greta loved herself more than she could bear. She never had enough and could never, ever share. Want was never more, it was only need. Her envy grew and grew, and with it came her greed. Greta needed more, but money wasn't flush, so she stole from her family. It gave her quite the rush. It is not enough, to herself, she would say. I must have it all. There is no other way. Into her grandparents' home, Greta crept inside. They had many treasures, jewelry and gemstones pied. But when she looked about, wealth she did not find. Only ancient Krampus with something on his mind. Greta shrieked and trembled, staring at his claws. She knew there would be no mercy from this evil Santa Claus. You shall have the riches, Krampus said with a grin, and he gave them to her after peeling off her skin. Herman was a doctor, for that's what he would say, and every single patient they would have to pay. He cut and pulled and burned, and after he was done, for more, he always yearned. This surgeon was a butcher who had a taste for swine. With their bleeding flesh, he'd pair a fine red wine. The hunger took him, body, mind, and soul. Yet this evil, it never took its toll. Herman was alone, in his chair he sat. All this human meat had made him very fat. He drifted off to slumber and began to snore until an angry Krampus burst through his door. Herman could not move. He wet himself in fright. Krampus licked his lips and let out a squeal of delight. First he gouged his eyes, and Herman could not see. Then Krampus filleted his tongue. It was tender as could be. Wilhelm was a grocer with all the town's supplies, but he was very greedy and made his prices rise. The poor could not afford it, and some began to starve, but Wilhelm only scoffed at them with plenty of meat to carve. He always made them beg for just the smallest bits of food. Their suffering made him laugh and brightened up his mood. Wilhelm sat alone, counting money by the fire, when he heard the footsteps, quite loud and very dire. 
Then Krampus stood before him and shook his rusty chain. Wilhelm begged and pleaded, praying for no pain. Krampus stripped him naked and hung him from a spire. The town then rejoiced, and they danced around his pyre. Summer was cold-hearted, despite her lovely name. A witch in nurse's clothing, treating the sick and lame. But for her patience she had no love, and prayed they all stayed ill. For when they slipped away, she smiled, and tarried another kill. She wept with their families, pretending to be sad. Yet when she went home at night, she danced like she was mad. As Summer bathed and closed her eyes, she began to dream, and Krampus crept into her room through a cloud of steam. The nurse did thrash as Krampus drowned her slow. And now her corpse is turning blue as the demon tossed her in the snow. Johann had a secret and he'd take it to the grave. This man loved his neighbor's daughter and wished to keep her as a slave. She was but only twelve, not yet halfway to his age. But Johann did not falter as he built the child's cage. The night had come, it was time to claim his prize. He snuck into her bedroom, a glimmer in his eyes. But in the child's chamber, a young girl he did not take. For lurking in the shadows was Krampus, hissing like a snake. When Johann cried, the Christmas demon let out a laugh as he grabbed the evil man by his legs and pulled him right in half. And now the child sleeps in peace, snuggled in her bed. For Johann's body, torn to bits, now keeps the maggots fed. Christmas is joyous, full of love and cheer. But you must remember the one that we all fear. So be kind to one another, show love and heed this text, or Krampus will find you, and you will certainly be. These stories were discovered on what can only be described as parchment paper with inconclusive carbon dates. The police are seeking any information that may help bring the killer to justice. After speaking with the detective assigned to the case, it would appear we have no leads or suspects. The killings appear to be unexplainable, both in nature and method of execution. It has led many of us to believe that there is not only a, a supernatural element to the murders, but we have no doubt that they will continue each year.
Merry Transmismus, gentle listener. Welcome back to the present. My, oh my, what a maddening marathon of transmismus mayhem that turned out to be. We do hope it has helped to set the mood for your transmismus celebration. This Transmismus special retrospective extravaganza was brought to you with the generous assistance of our Patreon subscribers. A particular thank you goes out to our esteemed cohorts. Stephanie Saloka, Sam Hankins, Alicia Townsend, Juliana Rantz, Stephen Andrews, Joe Stinson, Wayne Prince, Alex Brewis, Eugene Petrie, Sam Bell, Tippy Polo, Barry Jones, JB, Adam, Rachel Brown, Abaddon, Arnie Frank, Michael Wood, Robert Troy Hampton Peterson, and Evan Dooley. Until transmissions are recommenced in the new year, watch the skies. Fear the dark, and don't trust anyone, especially yourself. Happy Transmissmas to all, and to all a good night.